Fine Nano S is quiet, compact, and it's built for many ITX water-cooled systems just like this one. But watch out, if you get one, Josh might just show up at your house randomly. The fractal design to Fine Nano S is small, quiet, and built for many ITX water-cooled systems just like this one. But if you get one, watch out, because Fractal Josh might just show up at any minute. You know, Kyle's full of shit. Ugh. Well, that was immersive. Yeah, Paul's still not here yet. We've been here for like an hour. Dude, let's get the hell out of here. Screw it. <sighs> Excellent! What's up guys, welcome back. Here's my long-awaited review of the Asus X99 Deluxe 2 motherboard. Asus recently refreshed their X99 lineup to correspond with the launch of Intel's new enthusiast CPUs, the Broadwell E ones that launched back at the beginning of June 2016. You can check out my 6950X benchmarks via the card right up there. Older but still very powerful Haswell eCPUs are also supported, of course, as this board continues to use the LGA 2011 3 socket and X99 chipset. Round things out with a redesigned black, white, and gray color scheme, throw in some optional RGB lighting, add a generous stack of accessories in the box, and the $420 price tag starts to sound almost reasonable. So clearly at $420 this is a high-end board, and since the CPUs that work with it start at around $400 themselves, it is safe to say that this board is for enthusiasts who are looking for more than just a gaming rig. That price does at least get you tons of accessories, which was my complaint actually with the Maximus 8 formula from Asus that I reviewed a few months back, card up in the corner, which also had a premium price tag but I felt was short on add-ons. With the X99 Deluxe 2, you get eight black and white SATA cables, half of them with 90 degree angled connectors on one end, an RGB LED extension cable, just one ribbon style two-way or three-way SLI bridge. Not the prettiest in my opinion, and I would like to have seen a basic two-way bridge as well, or maybe one of those black ROG ones. There's also a Thunderbolt cable to connect the Thunderbolt card to the Thunderbolt header on the motherboard, a mini DisplayPort to DisplayPort cable for routing your GPU's video out into the Thunderbolt card, which can then be fed back out through the USB Type-C port, a silver and blue I.O. shield with squishy ESD backing, a stack of documentation for the fan extension card, the Hyper M.2 card, quick start guide, optical driver, and software CDs, I guess people still use these maybe, uh, as well as booklets for the Thunderbolt EX3 card and the actual motherboard itself. But wait, there's more! A couple small kits for CPU installation and vertical M.2 card installation, three temperature sensor cables with diodes you can place wherever you want in your system, a magnetic base antenna for the built-in dual band 802.11 AC Wi-Fi, a fan extension cable to connect the fan extension card, Q connector for more easily connecting front panel leads, screws for mounting M.2 and fan extension cards, the Hyper M.2 by 4 mini card for adding another M.2 slot to your system on top of the built-in one, the Thunderbolt EX3 card which gives you a really nice add-on in Thunderbolt connectivity, bi-directional connection speeds up to 40 gigabits per second as well as two additional USB 3.1 ports in Type-A and Type-C trim. Finally, the fan extension card that allows you to connect three more fans for a maximum of nine, two CPU fans and seven case fans, each with independent control from either the UEFI BIOS or the AI Suite 3 software. Wow, that's a lot of accessories. What about the motherboard itself though? The Asus X99 Deluxe 2 is heavy, first of all, which is usually an indicator of good build quality and higher bill of materials cost. For example, Asus has integrated some massive VRM heat sinks and a dense multi-layer PCB with a clean matte black finish. Speaking of the finish, black, white, and gray, or silver is the color scheme here with just the slightest hint of blue on some of the flare pieces and heat sink uh, covers. For memory support, you have eight DIMM slots for quad channel DDR4, up to 16 gigs per DIMM slot for up to 128 gigs total, and ASUS has validated kits going up to 3333 speed. ASUS is continuing to use their OC socket design, which has extra pins in the 2011-3 socket, which they say helps combat voltage drop for more stable overclocking. The PCIe slot uses the new safe slot steel reinforced implementation, which JJ told me last month integrates into the motherboard PCB for increased sturdiness, less flex with heavy GPUs installed. There's five full-length PCI Express by 16 slots and one by one slot, but bear in mind that the second full-length slot, the one without the steel reinforcement or the LED on the retention mechanism is a Gen 2x4 connection. X99 Deluxe 2 officially supports three-way SLI or crossfire configurations if you're using a 40 PCIe lane CPU like a 6950X or 5930K. Incidentally, in my build here, I am using a 5930K. Even with a 40 PCIe lane CPU, there are still some connectivity limitations since there is no PLX switch to provide more lanes. More on that though when I move on to storage. 
So for fan support, you get six total headers on the board, all of them four pin with auto detection of PWM or DC voltage control. There's two CPU fan connectors up above the CPU socket, two more along the right near the SATA ports for system fans, and then two more along the left just above the PCI Express. The left header here provides up to three amps for high speed, high current fans, and the right one is a pump header tuned for DC or PWM water cooling pumps. There are also seven temperature sensors scattered throughout the board, all software accessible, and of course the fan extension header lets you add three more fans and three more temperature sensors via that accessory. Along the bottom of the board, starting from the lower right, you've got front panel connectors, an XMP switch to force your memory to use XMP mode, a CPU over voltage header to increase the voltage values available for overclocking, an SLI and crossfire switch to more easily configure two-way and three-way GPU setups. This will also light up the corresponding PCIe slots with their LEDs to tell you which slot to install your GPUs to. That's kind of nice. A Thunderbolt header for the add-in card, a USB 2.0 and a couple USB 3.0 headers, an RGB header to connect compatible RGB LED strips, kind of like I have set up right here in front of me, trusted platform module header, fan extension header, a Q code button, and a debug LED, which is great for troubleshooting boot problems, surface mounted power and reset buttons. Thanks for not forgetting those, by the way, Asus. And finally, SPDIF and front panel audio headers. Storage options are plentiful on this board. There's a couple U.2 connectors for PCIe SSDs like the Intel 750 series, and a single vertical key M M.2 slot next to the 24 pin power supporting up to 80 millimeter length SSDs. Vertical orientation means it takes up less board real estate and your M.2 SSD will stay cooler. You also get 10 total SATA Rev 3 ports, 1 through 6 have RAID support, 4 through 8 have SATA Express option, and 9 and 10 are just normal SATA ports, just tucked away under the X99 chipset heatsink. You can of course add another M.2 via the accessory riser card. Going back to the PCIe lanes and connectivity though, remember that just because all these ports and slots exist, doesn't mean you can use them all at the same time. The manual elucidates the situation a little bit, listing which connections share bandwidth, mainly via the PCI Express slots sharing bandwidth with either the U.2, M.2, or USB 3.1 connections. For most people, this won't be an issue, but double check these conflicts if you really were planning for a three-way GPU setup with a couple U.2 drives and an M.2, you probably can't do all that at the same time. Moving up the right side of the board, we have a closer look at the aforementioned U.2 and vertical M.2 connectors, 24-pin main power connection, and the ASUS Memo K button, which is great for troubleshooting memory problems. For power delivery around the CPU socket, you have an eight-phase design with premium quality MOSFETs, chokes, and caps, and of course those two large dedicated heat sinks and a heat pipe connecting them, with the second one kind of tucked into the I.O. panel to get some of that heat out towards the rear of the system. Supplemental CPU power is delivered via eight-pin and four-pin connectors at the top of the board. The X99 Deluxe features Crystal Sound 3 audio, not quite as high-end as ROG boards since it uses a more standard Realtek ALC 1150 codec chip. Asus has made sure to give it the best conditions possible though with Japanese-made audio capacitors, a power pre-regulator, an audio amplifier, and a pop filter circuit. Crystal Sound 3 supports 8-channel surround and the components are EMI shielded with a PCB separation layer to minimize interference. On the rear panel, I.O. on the left is a BIOS reset button that can also be used for the USB BIOS flashback feature, still one of my favorite ASUS features in the last 5 or 10 years. There's two Intel Gigabit NICs wired in with the ASUS LAN guard to resist static discharge and power surges, four USB 3.0 ports with fast charge, four USB 2.0 ports, four more USB 3.1 ports, one of them with a Type-C connector, 3x3 antenna connectors for the 13 megabits per second 802.11 AC dual band Wi-Fi, and finally the gold-plated audio connections, 8th inch jack for mic in, 8 channel surround out, or an optical Toslink SPDIF connection. Okay, next up we're going to take a quick tour of the ASUS UEFI and then we'll wrap up with an Aura RGB LED demo. So here's the ASUS UEFI BIOS and it's uh, an easy mode right now, this is the default. Uh, it gives you a quick look at what BIOS version you have, CPU installed, uh, memory installed, that kind of thing, CPU voltage, uh, temperature. Uh, easy system tuning is over here so you can switch between some presets for normal quiet performance energy saving. Boot priorities here, you can drag and drop to move stuff around. Uh, you can actually pull up a whole boot men menu as well. What SATA uh, devices are connected, DRAM status and XMP, and your fan profile down here. Now you have some access to some pretty useful stuff here like QFAN control. You can actually select any of the fans in your system and set up a uh, custom fan curve for them, which is pretty convenient. Uh, also, of course, you still have advanced mode. So if you hit F7, 
we can go over to that. And advanced mode is probably going to be a little bit more familiar for uh, you guys who've done a lot of overclocking and stuff in the past. You can set up a favorites area where you can sort of pin things that you go to frequently if the easy mode isn't good enough for you. Uh, your main option, AI tweaker, here's where you do all of your overclocking stuff by core. Uh, and of course you have all the low level access to stuff such as DRAM time, timing and Digi Plus power control and CPU power management, tweakers paradise, all the really low level things that I'm too scared to actually mess with myself. Now you might notice here that I have a 4.4 gigahertz overclock that's been enabled here. I actually did that with the five-way optimization with the ASUS software. More on that in just a second. Anyway, here's advanced configurations for PCH and CPU and all that good stuff. Monitoring things such as CPU temperature and you can actually adjust those all individually or monitor them here. Uh, boot, of course, you can switch to fast boot mode or those different things. Uh, and then you've, you have the tools over here. I wanted to show the Easy Flash 3 utility, which lets you update the BIOS. Uh, now has easy, simple access so you can update straight from the internet rather than downloading your uh, BIOS and putting it on a flash drive, for example. And then uh, you also have secure erase function in here, which is great for wiping an SSD and uh, putting it back in kind of factory default, situa factory default settings, uh, which is nice for an SSD that you might have found is slowing down. And great to be able to do it here right from the UEFI. Back to that overclock though, I always like to run ASUS 5-way optimization when I get one of these boards just to throw in a chip and see what happens. Uh, it starts off with the automatic overclocking or auto-tuning. It runs uh, some automatic stress tests on the CPU and just ramps up the frequency until it gets to a point where it achieves instability. For this with my 5930K, it got to 4.4 gigahertz, running it at 1.275 volts, which is a uh, very nice straightforward, good overclock that most people would be happy with, and I got it with a single click. It also runs through the rest of the five-way optimization, so TPU, uh, Fan Expert 3 is next, so it reaches out, tests all the fans in your system, gets their min and max values, and sets them to a reasonable fan curve for quiet quietness as well as you know performance. EPU and Digi Plus power control are also uh, power savings features uh, for the full whole system, as well as for the digital power delivery specifically for the CPU. And here's a demo of the ASUS Aura RGB lighting, and since I know RGB LED lighting is not for everyone, look! There's an off switch. They all just turned off. Isn't that nice? Uh, do note that the uh, debug LED and the power and reset LEDs do stay on, even though the RGB LEDs are turned off. Anyway, turning them back on, you might notice that there's four different distinct areas here. So let me switch over to static. Audio, PCIe, PCH, and LED strip. So the audio is actually this bit uh, right over here, the crystal sound, which I'm hopefully pointing to with my knife. Yes, crystal sound right there. There's also the PCI Express slot snaps, or the, the kind of catches that light up. Four of those do right there. Uh, you can see the lower three right now. The top one is currently blocked by the graphics card. There's also uh, lighting just above the chipset, which is probably going to be the hardest to see here, but it would illuminate kind of the area just above the chipset. Again, kind of blocked by the graphics card right now. But then you might also notice that I have an LED strip plugged in down here. This is a cable mod RGB LED strip, and it is specifically sent to me, or it was specifically sent to me uh, for the Maximus 8 formula video. However, I did notice that the RGB is not in the proper orientation. So you might notice when I'm set to static, if I switch to say green, for example, uh, whereas the lights on the motherboard are kind of green, or they should be, right? Green? Oh, I'm only controlling the LED strip. Let's synchronize. Yay, synchronize. Okay. With everything synchronized, you'll notice if I switch to green, the uh, motherboard LEDs are green, but the LED strip below is blue. So uh, you can do red fine, because the reds are right. Look, everything's kind of red, reddish pink or something in that area. Um, however, Blue and green are switched. Uh, you could fix this by either uh, swapping, getting the, the, the connector cable and swapping uh, the lead, or ASUS could put back the calibration function that was there for RGB with the original Aura software. I don't know where it went. Maybe I just couldn't find it. It was hidden originally, but anyway. So right now we can see main board at the top because that is what I currently have installed. If you had a graphics card, it would also show up here. Uh, you have settings for startup and shutdown. So there are LEDs that are on while the system is shut down, but you can control that function here just as was the startup. Uh, you have, of course, the features that you would expect, such as static and breathing. These are what are very common when it comes to RGB LEDs in general now. Uh, but I am happy to say that there are some other options here. Strobing, I've never found to be all that useful. Strobing and double strobing, that seems to be popular, but color cycle uh, is useful, especially if you're using the add-on RGB LED strip because then it's cycling through colors and you can't tell that the, the, the green and the blue are, are swapped. Uh, rainbow, of course, is also an option here and that will sort of cycle through a bunch of rainbows. You might notice here you also have control over uh, the speed 
And then there's also Direction. Direction comes in with some of these other effects that they've implemented. I really kind of like Comet. So Comet will kind of cycle through. You can see it kind of crossing over uh, and you can switch downstream or upstream. So that just kind of switches the direction that it goes in back and forth. So you can see if you had this installed in a case, you could actually get a pretty cool effect. You can also cycle, cycle back and forth. So it'll go one way and then the other. And then of course you can control the speed here as well. Um, this is gonna synchronize automatically because it's Rainbow Comet. Uh, flash and Dash, I also thought was kind of fun. It uh, controls the actual uh, intensity of the lighting, so you get kind of a flash as it cycles through the different things. There's another, so a couple of really cool effects that I think Asus has, has implemented here that I actually found useful as opposed to just the regular static and breathing. Of course, you can get some more practical stuff like CPU temperature. So turn that one on and it will change the uh, color based on the temperature of your CPU. And then if you have music going on, you can switch to music f effect and the lighting will strobe along with the music as it plays in your system. So in conclusion, the things I like about this motherboard are that it is a significantly updated version of the X99 Deluxe that I've been using in the Arctic Panther back there for over a year now. More M.2, U.2, and USB 3.1 and Type-C are very welcome on this platform. Five-way optimization with automatic overclocking works great, and the board has all the features you could want within reason. The accessory package as well is very nice. Also the LED lighting, I know it's not for everyone, but it's integrated well and the Aura software has come a long way even just since my Maximus 8 formula video that I did a couple months back. It's nice to see some built-in effects other than static or breathing that I might actually want to use and the synchronization works very well. As for cons, I would say it's expensive, but honestly with the added accessories, it's not that bad compared to some of the highest end X99 boards out there. I've mentioned the limitations with connectivity if you really want to max the board out, so a PLX chip to add PCIe lanes would definitely have been cool, but I think that probably would have driven the price up to the $500 plus range. So to sum up, this is a beautiful, feature-packed, and well-designed motherboard, and I think any enthusiast who's dropping a couple grand on a Broadwell E workstation and gaming build will be very happy with it. Links to this motherboard on Amazon, as well as my Paul's Hardware store where you can buy shirts and other stuff like it are down in the description below. Hit that like button too and get subscribed to my channel if you enjoyed, and as always, thank you very much for watching my videos.